A few years ago, I was with a friend who wanted to start a safe water project up in uh, Pakistan. We're at a traffic light. There's a guy coming up the, to, and his arm is broken here and flopping around. And what's most likely happened is somebody's broke his arm for him and never said it so that he would be better at begging. And if you give him money, then he would give it to whoever broke his arm. Now that's a horrible, intentional distortion of charity. But charity is also distorted by the very best intentions. So the group we're meeting with in the slum there, they had a beautiful water treatment system. It would treat 1,000 jerry cans a day of water. And they were only doing 100. So, well, this is a great opportunity. You're not covering your costs, but if the existing customers, if they were to sign up, no, no, we can't do that. Okay, well, how about the shopkeepers in the slum? If they were to resell, no, no. And as it turns out, there was a very clear distinction between whose role is to give charity and whose role is to receive it. So we're trying to get past this impasse, so we show the story of Jackson. So Jackson's at the orphanage in Kajukeji, South Sudan, and he's had polio, so he's bent 180 degrees at the waist, and he has to walk on his hands and feet or use a special bicycle. I say, well, if Jackson lived here, what would he do? Oh, he would beg. Yeah, okay, but what else could he do if he lived here? No, Jackson would beg. Well, think about what kind of life that would be for Jackson. And then think about this life. Jackson's actually the math and science teacher for the orphanage. He's shaping the next generation of kids. And so this is the difference between empowerment-based approaches and just pure conventional charity. So what does this look like on a global scale? So since 1970, the amount of aid that we've given has tripled. So what would you expect the blue curve to be like? The effect on the economy of three times as much aid in these countries. You probably wouldn't expect this curve. These countries have had zero economic growth for the last 30 years. Now, corruption and war contribute to this, but I'm pretty sure we had corruption and war before 1970. We have to realize that the way we deliver our aid is actually causing damage. Now, how could that be? This is A&M Textiles in Tanzania. They make mosquito nets. So they're making a product everybody on their continent needs or they might die. The last day of our course, last February, uh, we were teaching water and we lost our entire class because they were called away to distribute mosquito nets door to door for free. Well, who does that? Well, it's typically a Western aid agency. Where do they get them? Do they get them from Tanzania? Or could they make the donation go a little bit further by buying cheaper ones from China, distributing them door to door? Now imagine your A&M textiles. You're not competing against cheaper ones from China. You're competing against free ones distributed door to door that aren't even available anymore. You're competing with the idea that somebody might come back and give another free one. So as a consequence, A&M laid off 600 employees last year. So what effect does that have on their extended families? Now if we were to do that in North America, it's actually illegal. We're not allowed to give away our engineering for less than it costs for us to provide it because we're unfairly creating a monopoly for ourselves. Our aid agencies are creating monopolies for themselves that they don't even want and they can't even handle once they get them. So what's the alternative? So the UN has 17 development goals. That's a lot to think about all at once. So let's look at three of them. Food, water, and energy. And we don't want to address with expensive cures. We want to find inexpensive, preventive ways to address the root causes. So energy. When we think of green energy, most of us think of solar panels. But there's something greener than a solar panel. And that's not using energy in the first place. So Southbrook Winery, they have the highest certification you can get. They're LEED Gold certified, organic, biodynamic. And they just had an energy audit done that said they could find another 5% savings with a 20-year payback. But with a deeper dive of the root causes, we were able to cut the energy by 40% with a 0.3-year payback. This avoided one-third of the panels, saved 20,000 liters a year or of wine, $20,000 a year worth of wine through prevention or food. So there's many people who don't have enough to eat. Meanwhile, in Canada, we're throwing away $31 billion a year of food. And we have a whole industry designed on how do we destroy this food as effectively as possible. But if we could prevent some of that loss. So this is Campbell's Soup. They've been around for 100 years, but they're still open to innovation. So just by changing six of their processes, we're able to find ways to avoid 938 tons per year of food waste which would save them $706,000 a year with a six month payback. And it would also avoid 4,000 tons per year of embedded greenhouse gas in those vegetables and meat 
that would have otherwise been lost when you send it to a waste energy plant. Or water. So a billion people don't have access to safe water. And bad water has killed more people than all wars. Now one of the prime culprits is typhoid. So typhoid, you get a fever, you get gut ache, headache, and there's a 20% chance you're going to die. Has anybody here had typhoid? So that's none. My friends in South Sudan have a hard time believing me when I say that, and this is why. This is the group in Ye, South Sudan. We asked uh, the health promoters, how many of them themselves have had typhoid? Half of them put up their hand. Because they're drinking the same water, how many have had it twice? A quarter. One guy had it five times. The lady on the right, seven people in her family had typhoid this year. Now you remember there's a 20% chance you're gonna die if you don't get treatment, so you're gonna come up with it. It's 50 bucks. But in our context, that'd be like $3,800. Now can you imagine if any time anybody in your family had a drink of water, you'd risk a bill of $3,800? How would you ever get out of poverty? So by now you're thinking of drilling wells, right? And as Canadians, we're big into this. And I want to pay for the well driller, and I want the first picture of the water coming out of the well. I don't want to pay for overhead, administration, anything like that. As a consequence, World Vision found that 45% of all the wells drilled in Africa don't work after one year. Why would they? Do you know how to repair a well? Do you have the spare parts to do it? So why would they? So if you're not going to invest in the system that's going to take care of this well, don't even bother drilling the well. Now, many charities are getting better at this, but it's actually a supply problem in the first place. If somebody's alive, they're getting water from somewhere. The question is, is the water safe to drink? So this is a water test kit for E. coli, basically bacteria from feces. To, you fill all those cells with water. If any turn blue, it's got E. coli. So to test it, we test our toilet bowl in our office and one out of 100 turned blue. We tested a nice looking borehole well in Jerusalem, South Sudan, every cell turned blue. So it's crazy to believe you're actually 800 times safer to drink the water in my toilet bowl in Elmira than the water coming out of this borehole well that somebody drilled for them. Well, as a chemical engineer, I know how to treat that. So we need some membranes and some ion exchange. And it's going to work great for two months until the first part breaks. But what if we were to build something local with the local materials instead? So this is a biosand filter. That technology has been around for hundreds of years. You create a home for the beneficial bacteria. They eat the harmful ones. And there's projects that use appropriate like technology like this all over the world. There's more than 5,000 of these projects in 190 countries. But almost all of them use the charity-based approach where you give them away, and as soon as you stop giving them away, the project's done. So this is Robert. Robert managed the project for 10 years in Uganda. So I said, Robert, how many of these filters have you sold? Zero. Well, what do you do? Well, we wait for the donor to sponsor. We construct them, and then we wait. Now the sad part is, everybody in town, it was actually cheaper to buy a filter at full price than what they're already spending on medicine. So what we do is we teach, teach social ventures. So what's important in a business? Well, in my own business, you have to at least break even. So we teach break even analysis, production planning, sales. And we have this board game that we developed um, to teach in those ways. And by February 2016, we had four projects in South Sudan manufacturing filters. By February 2017, there was a war in Kajikeji and Mundri, and Ye and Juba were both surrounded. So there's 3,000 refugees a day leaving Uganda to go into South Sudan. Among them is Matthew and his family, who was one of our managers. They're settled in and around Bidi Bidi, which is now the largest refugee camp in the world. Now, again, as Canadians, we know how to help, right? And if we got a report back from the charity, hey, Matthew and his family, they got some shelter, some food, some clothes, they're good. But what if that charity were to say, well, actually, instead, we didn't do that. We rented a conference hall for a week for 40 Ugandans and invited five of the refugees. You'd be pretty confused. But that's actually what we did. And Matthew and his team taught 40 Ugandans how to do the biofilters. That team went out. They sold 27 filters that month, which was more than the amount they needed to cover their costs to run their plan. And then they used that money to help build their own homes. So this is the difference between development and relief. Now, if I were to ask you, what is poverty? What kind of answer would you give me? Would your answer have something to do with a lack of money, lack of stuff? And if that's what poverty is, then the answer to poverty is obviously money and stuff. But the UN interviewed people who were actually in poverty, and the answers were more like shame, humiliation, I'm powerless to change my situation. What happens if you give a person like that free money and stuff? Does it reduce those things or exasperate? 
So the problem is we're solving the wrong problem. Now when I go inspecting biofilters, if I inspect one that was donated, the wife will be showing me how it works and I will never see the husband. He'll be off in the corner of the garden keeping himself busy. That filter was free, but it was bought with his dignity. But if I inspect a filter that was bought by that family, again, the wife will be showing me how it works. The husband will barge in, explain to me how it works because he's proud of what he's provided for his family. So this is Erasmus, he was our first customer, and 10 years ago, so he's had more than 200,000 liters of water from that filter. Now in this picture, it's hard to say who's actually happier, Erasmus buying that filter or Godfrey selling to him. And speaking of happy, this is Don, he was our first corporate sponsor. He was the corporate uh, director of manufacturing for Tim Hortons Canada. And basically what happened was we helped them with their icing and fruit filling factory to save 490,000 of ingredients and utilities. They took 1% of that, they sponsored 40 filters in Africa. Now those 40 filters in Africa aren't even being used anymore because of the war, but that training lives on. So you've heard, give a man a fish, eats for a day. Teach a man a fish, eats for a lifetime. The problem is that giving out free fish feels really good. And it looks very responsible for the agency distributing those fish. But teaching the fish takes a lot longer and doesn't look as responsible for the charity. But what if you teach somebody to teach somebody else how to fish? So it's been 10 years since we taught Matthew how to make biofilters. Matthew taught Daria, who started the project in Juba. Daria taught Nelson, who started the project in Ye. And this month, Nelson and uh, Matthew are starting the project in Arua, South uh, Uganda. So do I still give to charity? Absolutely, yes. Because charities, most of them have very good intentions. It's just in the delivery and the short-term focus that things sometimes fall apart. You remember that the project in Uganda, they sold 27 filters the first month. The second month, the charity said, this is a great project. We want to buy 300 filters at full price if you distribute, distribute them free of charge, or nearly free of charge around town. So this is a tremendous boost for the project, 300 sales. And for these 300 families, that's a bene you know, benefit for them. But in the long term, how are these 45 people going to sell filters when everybody expects them to be nearly free? And who's going to get sick while they wait for a free one that might never come instead of buying one themselves? And so I can understand wanting to help these donors who want to distribute free fish. But what if the donors like us were to say, actually, can you take our donation and use it for your own overhead to train and empower these local projects? If we work that way, not only are the objectives that we're working on would increase, but every other one, poverty re relief, equality, peace, justice, climate change. So when you invest in charity, invest in shared, durable prosperity. Thank you.